Hi everybody. Uh, this is uh, the introduction to your persuasion speech. It's also going to be an overview of the fundamentals of persuasion so that you can successfully uh, complete your speech. Uh, let's uh, get started. Uh, your assignment is going to be a persuasion speech, not a, uh, uh, a speech to inform. Uh, it will be seven to nine minutes. First thing that you probably need to know is what are the types of persuasion speeches that you have to choose from. Let's take a look. First, you have a speech to convince. In a speech to convince, you want to change the attitudes, beliefs, or values of your audience. Now, what does that presuppose? Well, obviously, uh, that presupposes that you know what the beliefs and values of the audience are. Now, you may have some kind of a working knowledge, generally, based on your interactions with your classmates throughout the semester, that you have an idea of what they may value or what they may believe in. Uh, and if you think they're thinking wrong on that, then you might want to change their mind. Uh, however, uh, without a firm understanding of the beliefs and values of your audience, uh, that might be a difficult choice. The second choice is a speech to stimulate. Uh, to enhance or stimulate attitudes, beliefs, or values that the audience already has. Now, likewise, you, uh, you kind of need to know uh, kind of what the audience is thinking, and it may be that um, they're rather uh, nonchalant about it, or they don't take it very seriously, or they haven't given it a great deal of thought, and you want to heighten their feelings about that. You want to stimulate their feelings, their beliefs, their attitudes, what they're thinking. And that may be a good choice. The last choice is a speech to actuate, and there will be a number of you who will choose uh, a speech to actuate, and basically what you want to do is you want to move your audience uh, to action. You're actually going to ask them to do something, to uh, when, they leave the, uh, when they leave the audience, uh, to go out and do something immediately, or tomorrow, or next week, or next month, but to take some kind of overt action. Whereas the first two have to do with what people are thinking, what they believe in, what their attitudes are. So, those are your choices. Uh, you need to make a decision based on that. Um, choosing a good topic. Uh, you know, this is an opportunity, uh, especially if you were speaking in front of the class, and of course, uh, for this assignment, you'll be doing it on YouTube, and I don't know who your audience will be, it may be family members, it may be friends, but it isn't going to be the class. But in a, uh, in a perfect world, in a classroom, you would have an opportunity, uh, certainly, uh, to uh, talk about something that you're passionate about, something that you're knowledgeable about, something that's been on your mind. This is an opportunity to get it off your chest, and you've got a captive audience theoretically, and I would like you to proceed under that notion that you do have an audience sitting in front of you. Um, some things that you might want to consider. Uh, is research available? Now, research is going to be absolutely key in this speech. And the reason for that is because we're not necessarily interested in what you think. Can you back it up with documentation? And we'll get to that in just a moment. And are you willing to select a topic despite what the class reaction might be. Of course, you don't have a class sitting in front of you, so you probably don't have to take an awful lot of consideration uh, into that. But uh, it, this is about being brave, being bold, uh, to talk about something that may ruffle the audience's feathers a little bit, but you believe that uh, their feathers need to be ruffled. Uh, let's get into the persuasive appeals. Uh, once you know what kind of persuasion speech you want to deliver, then how will you deliver it? To what, you, to what will you appeal? Will you appeal to the logos or the logic of an argument? Will you appeal to the emotional appeal, that is pathos? Or uh, are you going to rely on the reputation that you have based on your experience or your expertise, and that's the most persuasive power that you have. Uh, so you may use a combination of these, threes, of these three uh, uh, appeals. Uh, let's take a closer look. Uh, under the uh, logos or the logic, uh, this is based on reason, 
uh, you would use a lot of statistics, facts, testimony. It relies on the logic of the, pers of the persuasion. In pathos, of course, you're going to appeal to emotion, uh, obviously. And then, of course, the ethos, uh, and that's based on the character of the speaker. Um, obviously, you could use one or more of these appeals. So your speech could be primarily based on logic and, as we say, nailed down with emotion. It could be based a lot of, on emotion, but kind of nailed down with some degree of logic. Uh, these are your choices. Um, in, uh, in logical proofs, you want to present evidence and reasoning that the, le that the listeners will uh, respect. Under the emotional proofs, you want to relate to people's feelings, their passions, their perceptions, get the, get the audience to feel your ideas. And of course, uh, under ethos, the speaker's personal character, uh, get the listeners to respect you based on your reputation. Okay, uh, the next thing that you need to take into consideration uh, is uh, what your specific purpose is going to be. Now, in the informative speech, uh, we had you uh, put down your topic and then your specific purpose. Now, your specific purpose in the persuasion speech is going to be one of two things. Is it going to be a claim or is it going to be a proposition? Okay, let's look at a claim. When you offer a claim, you're claiming something, the audience is going to say to you, prove it! Can you prove it? If it is a proposition, the audience is going to say, convince me of your proposal, or why should I adopt your proposal? So, if it is a claim, then you're going to have to prove it with evidence. If it is a proposition, you're going to have to prove it to get them to do what you want them to do. Okay, let's, uh, let's look at these. And uh, let me read them to you and see if you can figure out whether it is a claim or a proposition. Let me read them to you. Electric cars will reduce greenhouse gases. Is that a claim or is that a proposition? If you were to say to the audience, you know, electric cars will reduce greenhouse gases, the audience would say back to you, prove it. Yes, it's a claim. Students get a better education in charter schools. Well, that's obviously a claim. How are you going to prove that? What kind of evidence are you going to provide? It is a citizen's responsibility to serve on a jury when called. Well, you're, you're not claiming anything, but you are proposing something. This is something that the audience should do. Yes, it's a proposition. Healthcare workers should be required to have the swine flu vaccine. Um, I, guess, um, I guess today we would say that uh, healthcare workers are required to have the coronavirus vaccine. That is, if we had a vaccine. Uh, yes, uh, the point is, though, that it is a proposition. Volunteer one day a month in an activity that makes your community a better place. Are you asking the audience to do something? Are you proposing something? Then it's a proposition. Set aside some percentage of every salary check you get in a low-risk, interest-bearing account to develop an emergency or contingency fund. Once again, you're asking the audience to do something, uh, not to believe something, but to do something, so obviously it's a proposition. Uh, let's talk about reasoning. Uh, going into the fundamentals of um, uh, uh, persuasion now, uh, Let's, uh, let's talk about reasoning, because see, unlike the speech to inform, which is very much like a reporter in a speech to inform, you're merely relaying to the audience the, the, uh, the how, when, where, under what circumstances. It's pretty straightforward, and then providing the documentation for what you're providing. Uh, a persuasion speech involves some strategy. Uh, what line of reasoning are you going to use? Um, what method, what strategy will you employ uh, in order to get the audience to do what you want them to do or to believe your claim? So let's look at them. For, uh, there are four that I'm going to go over. Inductive reasoning, deductive reasoning, causal reasoning, and of course reasoning by analogy. Let's, uh, let's go through them. Okay. 
uh, inductive reasoning. This assumes an orderly universe and it's inferred based on observation and expertise. Now, my wife likes orchids. We've got orchids uh, pretty much all over the house and out by the pool. And I went around to orchid number one and I realized that it has no fragrance. I went to the other side of the lanai and I, uh, I, I looked at another orchid, orchid number two, and I noticed that it has no fragrance. And then I went inside and there was an, uh, an orchid on the countertop and it has no fragrance. Well, based on that, those observations, then inductively, I would conclude that it's probable that all orchids have no fragrance. Does that sound pretty reasonable? Well, you may say, well, I'm not sure that's not based on a very large sampling. You only sampled three. Well, would it be more probable if I said that uh, I attempted to see if, uh, uh, if uh, five orchids had fragrance? Or how about 10? Or how about 15? You might be more inclined to accept that line of reasoning based on the number of the sampling. Regardless, regardless of the number of the sampling, there is probably with inductive reasoning always some little degree of skepticism. So with inductive reasoning, you're going to have to apply this criteria. You're going to have to look at this uh, continuum chart and then place where you think that proposal or that claim is. Okay. Now, with the, uh, with the example that I used on um, sampling three orchids around the house that had no fragrance, where would you place it on this continuum? Would you place it at probable? Would you place it at almost certain? Maybe not. Is it possible? Well, um, you're not sitting in front of me to get an answer, but I think most people would probably place that somewhere between probable and almost certain, maybe right around there, okay? But it all depends on the validity and the believability of the sampling. Uh, would you want to hang on just a second? This, uh, this microphone is popping a little bit. Okay, I turned it. I turned it down a little bit. Okay, um, what if I told you this? Um, uh, if if I said that uh, spider number one, that's the um, the black widow spider, it is a carnivore. Well, it's obviously a carnivore because uh, it eats its mate. Uh, how about the um, crab spider? We have those around here. They look like a little crab. Um, they're a carnivore. Uh, what if I said the uh, brown recluse? You want to watch out for those. They're very poisonous. But it is a carnivore. It eats insects and so forth. Therefore, um, I conclude that all spiders are carnivores. Well, you might adopt that pretty easily. Well, let me share a story with you. A number of years ago when I was running a resort in uh, uh, Costa Rica, uh, there was a story that really uh, took uh, Costa Rica by surprise. Down in the southern border, in the Pacific side of Costa Rica, near the Panama border, uh, there is an ecological area uh, called the, I can't remember the name of the peninsula right now, it'll come to me in a second, uh, but it has one of the most diverse ecosystems anywhere on the planet. And about 10 or 15 years ago, they discovered, believe it or not, a vegetarian spider. Who would have thought? So the whole point is, with inductive reasoning, there's always that little bit of degree of skepticism based on the sampling. Okay, let's move on. Deductive reasoning. Uh, this is based on known facts. Okay, uh, This is called the syllogism. And this is the way it works. A equals B. B equals C. Therefore, A equals C. Do you see how that works? A equals B. Okay? B equals C. Well, then if A equals B, then A also equals C. And that's the syllogism. 
okay? It's finding patterns uh, that, uh, that, you, that you know, not, uh, not based on observation, but based on fact, okay? Uh, it is a logical approach. But let's take a look at it. First of all, you have to accept the premise. And here's the premise, as in this example. Students enrolled in degree programs at Valencia College are seeking better career opportunities. Got it? Sally is enrolled in a degree program at Valencia College. Therefore, Sally is seeking a better career opportunity. Is that irrefutable logic? It is a syllogism, but is it irrefutable? How powerful is that? Well, you might say, well, yeah, of course, that's pretty powerful. Except, you know, I know Sally. And in my 25, 30 year of teaching, I've known a number of Sallys. And they're not always in college for the reasons that may be apparent. For example, uh, Sally may be enrolled in a degree program because her parents said, unless you are in a degree program, you're not going to get a new car. Uh, and there could be a number of other reasons why Sally is enrolled in a degree program. Maybe she's enrolled in a degree program to get the maximum amount of uh, college uh, support, financial support. Uh, I don't know. But the fact of the matter is, even though this is a powerful, logical uh, line of reasoning, uh, once again, you must accept the premise. And in this case, you can't necessarily accept the premise, although it would be pretty easy to accept that premise. Okay, causal reasoning. One cause leaves inevitably to one effect. Two comparisons must be present. When the cause is present, there is effect. When the cause is removed, the effect does not appear. Okay? For example, a rash occurs every time I eat tomatoes and never appears when I don't eat tomatoes. Well, that's, that's pretty powerful. I eat a tomato, I get a rash. I don't get a rash when I don't eat a tomato, okay? Oh, how about this one? Uh, morning sickness and weight gain often occur together. Therefore, morning sickness must cause weight gain. Of course not. Of course not. Here's the point. Uh, both of those things must occur. For example, when you have morning sickness, uh, and weight gain often, but they're, but they're not directly connected. So that second one is not good reasoning. Okay, let's move on. Uh, reasoning by analogy. Uh, comparing two things of the same category. A and B, and here's the operative words, are similar in all uh, relevant ways. What we know about A, you can also say about B. Here we go. Here's the literal analogy. Repairing the Hubble telescope is not unlike changing out an alternator in a car. Well, that sounds pretty absurd. Except when you, when you look at it, with both, you have to have the right tools, you have to have replacement parts, and a step-by-step -step procedure. You need those three things when you're changing out a, 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 an alternator in a car, and you need those things also when you're repairing the, the Hubble telescope. It's, it's, a, it's pretty bizarre, but the fact of the matter is, that is a literal analogy. And then, of course, one that's really fun and we use in our society a lot is the figurative analogy. Here's a couple of examples. Getting my teenager son to mow the lawn is like talking to a wall. What happens when you talk to a wall? Nothing. What happens when you talk to your son about mowing the lawn? Nothing. Here's another one. Putting more money into this project is like throwing it down a hole. What happens to your money when you throw it down a hole? It goes away. What happens when you throw it into this project? It goes away. That's the, that's the uh, reasoning by analogy. Could you use more than one lines of reasoning in your speech? Yes, but you need to be aware of what strategy are you going to be using, what lines of reasoning are you going to be using to uh, either 
get your audience to adopt your proposition or uh, to believe your claim. Okay. Okay, you are familiar with part of this motivated sequence for your speech to inform. The attention step, the need step, and the satisfaction step. In the persuasion speech, we add two additional steps. The visualization step and the action step. So, um, so in the visualization step, you want to project the audience into the future. Visualization means future. You want to project the audience into the future and explain to them what the situation is, what the condition would be if they accept your proposition or they are, they, um, uh, you, or, or you have proven your claim. Or you might, you might want to take the opposite point of view. You might want to project them into the future and explain to them what will happen, what the condition may be, if they do not accept what you want them to do or do not or have not or if you have not uh, they have not accept accepted the proof that you have provided for your claim and then uh, following that is the action step now every speech will have an action step but uh, in the speech to actuate which is one of the three speeches that you can pick for your persuasion speech uh, you're actually going to ask the audience to do something overtly. Uh, uh, for example, uh, you might want them to vote. You might want them to write a letter to their congressman. Uh, that would be an overt action. Uh, but every speech will have a speech to actuate because uh, even though you might not want them uh, to get up off their duff and go do something, you might want them to have a broader view. Uh, maybe to consider something, maybe to be more aware of something, or maybe to change their minds, to change their belief, to change their attitude. Every speech will have a speech to actuate. Some will have more overt actions than others. Okay? So, uh, you're certainly going to get the audience's attention, uh, create the need to listen, uh, provide your evidence, using the effective lines of reasoning and emotional, and not, uh, not emotional appeals, but persuasive appeals, and then of course project them into the future and explain to them what happens if they do or do not accept you and your point of view, um, and exactly tell them what you want them to do. Okay. Okay, let, me, uh, let me finish up this lecture today uh, with this notion, this analogy, if you will. Now, I am a fan of uh, courtroom dramas. My dad was a judge. Um, I've always been interested in that. And it does occur to me that probably the ultimate persuasive endeavor is a courtroom trial. And I think this may help you, especially as you apply the following notion uh, to the motivated sequence. What's the first thing that the, either one of the attorneys does in a trial as they stand before the jury? Or what is the first thing that the judge asks the attorney to do? Opening statement. In the opening statement, um, the, uh, the attorney uh, explains what the situation is, what has brought them to this situation today. What is the view? What's going on here? What's the situation? That's the opening statement, okay? And it also projects uh, to the jury what the attorney's strategy is going to be to either convict or to acquit uh, the, uh, uh, the person who's on trial. So that has an awful lot to do with the motivated sequence with the attention step and the need step. Obviously, what, uh, what's going on? Uh, obviously, you'll get the audience's attention. And it might be a rhetorical question, it might be a quotation. But as you progress into the need step part of the motivated sequence, if you consider this to be the opening statement to your audience, okay? What's going on? What's the situation? Wh why have you come to this topic? Uh, what's your strategy going to be? Um, your strategy may be, I'm going to provide overwhelming statistics and testimony 
to support the claim. Now here's the point. Somewhere in the attention step, in the need step, you are going to have to state your proposition or state your claim. Now when you declare your topic, and you're going to be sending those to me via email, uh, here's a couple of guidelines I, don't want, I want you to be aware of. Don't pose a question like, um, uh, why is such and such important? Don't pose it as a question. State your claim. Or offer your proposition. Okay? So don't ask a question. Also don't phrase it like this. The benefits of voting. See? No. It, no. It, uh, make a claim or proposition. Voting is... Uh, voting is... Um, uh, uh, voting is essential in order to maintain a democracy. That's a claim. Or, it is important as a citizen's responsibility that everybody who's eligible to vote should and must vote. That's a proposition. So don't ask a question, or don't, uh, don't phrase it as, what are the benefits or the benefits are. State it as a claim, or state it as a proposition. Okay? So that's the attention step and the need step. Um, and instead of going over the main points, uh, just project to the audience the strategy that you're going to be using. Are you going to be using testimony? Are you going to be using stories? Are you going to be using statistics? How are you going to get the audience to do what you want them to do or to believe what you want them to believe? And then the satisfaction step, uh, the, uh, the, uh, if you regard it in this manner, the judge would say to, uh, uh, to the attorneys, state your case or not state your case, but uh, state your case would be in the, in the need step. Make your case. Okay, provide the evidence. Provide the testimony. Provide the statistics. Visualization step is obvious to project the audience based on the evidence that I have provided. Here's what you can expect. Or here's what would happen if you don't accept it. And then, of course, the action step is this is what I want you to do. Okay? Now, uh, in the visualization step, in the action step, it could be compared to the next step in a jury trial when the, uh, when the judge says to the attorney, what's your closing statement? And the closing statement would very much be the visualization step and then uh, exactly uh, the, the attorney would turn to the jury and tell the jury exactly what he or she wants them to do. And of course that would be the action step. So. Your speech will have an attention step, opening statement, uh, need step, uh, what brought you here, what's your strategy going to be. Okay. Satisfaction step, make your case, provide your evidence, provide your testimony, whatever the situation is, what appeals are you going to use, what lines of reasoning. Visualization step, closing statement, action step, this is what I want you to do. Okay. So I think if you think of it that way, uh, I think it might make some sense to you. Okay? Um, I have sent a copy of these slides to you via email, uh, and I also will be sending you in the next day or so, I'll send you a sample outline based on the motivated sequence that you see here on the screen. Okay? Uh, I will be posting this uh, to YouTube uh, sometime today, and um, obviously, uh, go to YouTube. I'll send you a link to go to YouTube. Uh, look at it, declare your topic, and uh, get your topic uh, approved, and then go ahead and prepare your speech. Okay, uh, that's all for today.